Coming up on this Tuesday edition of Newsline at noon, a little under a day after South Korea exchanged artillery fire with North Korea, Seoul's defense ministry says there's no indication the North will launch further provocations as of now. With today marking the 10th anniversary since Korea's first ever free trade agreement took effect with Chile, figures show the nation's auto industry is benefiting the most from the nation's FTAs. Plus, Federal Reserve Chair Janet Yellen says the central bank's easy money policies aimed at boosting the U.S. economy will be needed for some time to come. These stories are more on Newsline at noon. Thanks for joining us. You're watching Newsline at noon. I'm Oh Jin Ju in Seoul. Very good to have you with us. I'm Mark Broom. Our top story this lunchtime. Less than a day has passed since the two Koreas peppered each other's territorial waters with artillery shells in the latest sign of rising into Korean tensions. For the latest on the cross-border firings, we now go live to our Kim Hyun Bin, who's standing by at the Ministry of National Defense in Seoul. Kim Bin, we hear the ministry just held a briefing. Good what are they saying? Uh, South Korean Defense Ministry spokesperson Kim Min Suk, in a press briefing a little over an hour ago, uh, said that currently there are no signs that North Korea is preparing for any additional provocations. Uh, the ministry says the artillery rounds fired on Monday afternoon were from multiple rocket launchers, which lack accuracy, especially compared to the precision of the K-9 self-propellant heavy artillery used by South Korea. Officials say that out of the 500 shells fired by uh, the North uh, during a live fire military drill, around 100 fell almost three and a half kilometers over the border in South Korean waters near the Pyongyangdo Island. Uh, South Korea responded by shooting 300 K-9 self-propelled heavy artillery shells into North Korean waters and dispatched several F-15 fighter jets to the maritime border. Mm -hmm. But we hear that the defense ministry is preparing for any contingencies or possible provocations, even though say, they said no to this at this point. Uh, despite no signs of another provocation, so the South Korean military remains on high alert, uh, working closely with the United States, uh, keeping a close watch on North Korea. Uh, Seoul's military has activated crisis management operations and deployed Navy uh, convoys near the maritime border to cope with any possible contingency. Uh, several inter-Korean skirmishes have taken place around the area over the years, including the north shelling of Yongpyeongdo Island in 2010, which killed four South Koreans. Uh, the ministry added that at the current state, North Korea is unlikely to conduct a fourth nuclear test or launch a long-range ballistic missile. Okay, thank you very much, Hyun Bin. That was our Kim Hyun Bin reporting live from the Defense Ministry in Seoul on South Korea's response to yesterday's exchange of artillery fire. So, North Korea is once again finding itself on the receiving end of international criticism for firing all those artillery rounds into South Korean waters. Mm -hmm. The United States has slammed Pyongyang for its actions, and even North Korea's closest ally, China, has expressed its deep concern. Our UDN has the details. The United States called North Korea's firing of around 100 artillery rounds into South Korean waters on Monday as dangerous and provocative, adding that Pyongyang's threats will only isolate the regime even further. We remain steadfast in our commitment uh, to the defense of our allies, and we remain in close coordination with uh, both the Republic of Korea and Japan. U.S. State Department Deputy Spokeswoman Marie Harve said she was concerned about North Korea's deliberate decision to further escalate tensions. Uh, they can choose to further escalate or they can choose to come in line with their international obligations uh, and rejoin the international community. Unfortunately, what we've seen recently particularly is the former. U.S. Defense Secretary Chuck Hagel urged North Korea to discontinue such provocations. He said he would discuss the issue with his Chinese counterpart during a trip to Beijing next week. China's Foreign Ministry spokesman Hong Lei expressed concern over the rising tensions on the Korean Peninsula and called for restraint from both sides. North Korea on Monday afternoon fired around 100 shells into South Korean waters across the disputed Western Sea border, known as the Northern Limit Line, prompting South Korea to fire back in response. The exchange came on the heels of warnings out of Pyongyang that it may conduct a new form of nuclear test. 
Pyongyang has been raising its levels of threats in recent days after the United Nations condemned its mid-range missile launches last week and against a backdrop of joint military drills between South Korea and the United States. Yurian, Arirang News. Now, experts continue to scramble to interpret what North Korea meant when it threatened a new form of nuclear test earlier this week. Some believe the regime was hinting that it's working on a bomb that would pack more punch than the three previously tested. Kim min reports. North Korea is believed to have used plutonium-based bombs in its first and second nuclear tests in 2006 and 2009. Although not confirmed, experts believe their third test last year used a uranium-based bomb since the detonation was two times greater than in previous tests. The difference between the materials is significant. Plutonium is made by reprocessing fuel used in nuclear reactors. It is a long process and requires a large reprocessing facility. Uranium, on the other hand, requires only an enrichment process. With just a centrifuge, a nuclear bomb can be produced almost anywhere, even in a two-story building. North Korea is said to have the ability to greatly expand its nuclear bomb reserves because of plentiful uranium deposits, which also have a long half-life. There is a high chance that plutonium will not explode because the explosive device is elaborate. However, uranium involves a relatively simple technique. If the two are separated and put together, it will explode 100 percent of the time. However, there are limitations. Miniaturizing a uranium bomb and mounting it on an intercontinental ballistic missile is impossible. So how does this all relate to the North's recent threat to carry out a new form of test? Experts say it could mean the regime is looking at trying out a reinforced type of nuclear weapon. If tritium and heavy hydrogen are placed in the core of a bomb and surrounded by plutonium and uranium, it can increase the explosive power by up to 10 times. It is more powerful than a regular nuclear bomb, but less so than a hydrogen bomb. Such a bomb can be easily miniaturized and also has the advantage of being light. Kim min Arirang News. North Korea has denounced President Park Geun-hye's reunification speech, which she delivered last week during her state visit to Germany. In a much-anticipated speech in Dresden last Friday, President Park proposed three ways to bring the two Koreas together, increasing humanitarian aid, holding more family reunions with North Korea, and assisting in North Korea's infrastructure projects. North Korea's state-run Korean Central News Agency on Monday condemned her remarks on the country's economic difficulties and hungry children. It said the reality of life in North Korea had been distorted by lies uttered by defectors and false information from South Korea's spy agency. Monday's report marked the first time North Korea has commented on the president's reunification initiative. Washington's special envoy for North Korean human rights issues will be making visits to South Korea and Japan this week and the next. The U.S. State Department said Monday that Robert King will be in the region from April 2nd to the 10th for talks on a wide range of human rights and humanitarian issues. He'll meet with officials in Tokyo on Thursday and Friday where discussions will center on issues related to Japanese nationals who were abducted by North Korea decades ago. King will be in Seoul on Monday and Tuesday of next, meet, of next week to meet with government officials. He's also scheduled to give a lecture at a university in Seoul. King's schedule for the weekend was not revealed. Now, the United Nations is injecting more money into North Korea for the purposes of providing emergency aid. The UN Central Emergency Response Fund recently gave six and a half million US dollars to four of its partners working in the North. Uh, nearly half of it went to the World Food Program and another million dollars went to the World Health Organizations. The four organizations will use the money to sustain their relief efforts in the North. The nation received more than $15 million last year through the UN Humanitarian Fund. Stay up to date on the latest news out of Korea. Connecting to our team of reporters about the issues that matter to Korea. On air, on your mobile, online. Find out more about Korea on Newsline at Noon with Mark Broom and Ah Jin Ju.
U.S. Federal Reserve Chair Janet Yellen says there's still room for the central bank to help the economy. She offered a passionate defense of the Fed's easy money policy on Monday, making clear the struggling U.S. job market will continue to need the help of low interest rates for some time to come. Tim and Gill has more. In her first public speech since becoming Fed chair two months ago, Janet Yellen cited the struggles of three American workers to back up the central bank's policies of low interest rates and continued bond buying. She said considerable slack still exists in the job market, a sign that further monetary stimulus can still be effective. I think this extraordinary commitment is still needed and will be for some time. And I believe this view is widely shared by my fellow policymakers at the Fed. The Fed has held interest rates near zero for more than five years now. The central bank says it will keep rates there for a considerable time, even after it ends its bond buying program, which is on course to be wound down later this year. Yellen said the U.S. economy remains well short of the Fed's goals of maximum sustainable employment. I believe the Fed's policies will continue to help sustain progress in the job market. But the scars from the Great Recession remain, and reaching our goals will take time. U.S. stocks rose on Monday, with the Standard & Poor's 500 ending March with moderate gains. Yellen's remarks calmed investors, many of whom had grown anxious the Fed might raise short-term rates by mid-2015. Arirang News. Now back here in the nation, Korean exporters aren't just weathering the storm of economic uncertainties abroad, they seem to be thriving. In fact, the nation's exports rose to their second highest mark on record in March. Arirang News' Hwang Jie has the details. Korea's trade ministry said Tuesday that the nation's exports rose 5.2 percent last month from the same period a year earlier to over 49 billion U.S. dollars. That is the second highest mark on record following the highest monthly figure of over 50 billion posted in October last year. The ministry attributed the rise to growing shipments to advanced economies including the United States. Exports to the U.S. jumped 17 percent in March from the previous year, while those to the European Union rose 15 percent. Korea's exports to the U.S. in particular slowed in the first two months of the year due to the harsh winter there, with the rate of rise remaining in the single figures. By product mobile communication devices such as handsets soared over 30 percent, with shipments of automobiles rising 16 percent. Korea's imports, meanwhile, reached $45 billion last month, up 3.6 percent from the previous year, helped by an increase in purchases of consumer goods. The trade surplus came to around $4.2 billion. The trade ministry expects the domestic economy to continue its pace of export growth in the second quarter of this year on improved economic conditions in advanced countries. Hong Jie, Arirang News. It's been exactly 10 years since Korea's first ever free trade agreement with Chile came into effect. Korea's auto industry has benefited the most from the country's FTAs, while the nation's farmers are less satisfied with the trade deals. Our Nayeon Young reports. The trade volume between Korea and Chile has jumped four and a half times to more than seven billion U.S. dollars over the past ten years. Exports grew from 500 million to two and a half billion dollars, while imports more than quadrupled to 4.7 billion dollars, according to the Korea Customs Service. Given that Korea's overall trade volume increased about threefold in the same period, experts say the trade sector has, without question, benefited from the Korea-Chile FTA. Since 2004, Korea has entered into nine free trade pacts with a total of 46 countries, and the nation's automobile industry remains the biggest beneficiary. But very real concerns linger over the impact on the nation's agricultural industry. In order to minimize the negative effects on the domestic agricultural sector, experts are calling for reforms in the market's retail structure. 
Four items that are dominant in the market, more open competition needs to be in place so that the consumers can reap the benefits. Korea's retail industry also tends to be monopolistic. Diverse retail channels will help products compete in a fairer manner. Questions over whether the nation's small and mid-sized firms have seen any benefits also remain. A survey conducted by the Korea International Trade Association shows that although 60 percent of the nation's SMEs with sales of less than $9.3 million utilized the FTAs, nearly half felt that the trade deals had not helped them in any way. Trade officials have called for more detailed and customized information to be readily available to the SMEs so that they can strategize and pave themselves an easier path into the overseas market. Lai hyun Gyeong, Arirang News. South Korea's consumer prices grew at their fastest pace in seven months in March. According to Statistics Korea on Tuesday, the country's consumer price index rose 1.3 percent in March from a year earlier to mark the fastest on-year rise since August last year when it gained 1.5%. The government attributed the last month's rise to height childcare tuition fees as well as increasingly expensive processed food like snacks. Agricultural prices saw a slight drop but livestock and marine product prices rose compared to a month earlier. Samsung SDI, the group's, the group's unit in charge of developing battery technologies and affiliate Jail Industries have merged, creating Samsung's fifth largest business unit. Our Connie Kim has the details. The world's leading TV display and smartphone battery manufacturer, Samsung SDI and Jail Industries, the group's chemical and electronics material unit, have merged, creating a giant parts and materials company. Starting out as display producer, Samsung SDI has expanded into making rechargeable batteries. Tail concentrates on its chemicals and electronic materials business after it sold its fashion division to Samsung Everland last year. SDI says it hopes the acquisition creates a synergy effect by combining its battery business line and Tay's electronics materials used in semiconductors and displays. The merger with Jail Industries gives SDI access to Jail's electronics. It also makes Samsung SDI more competitive in the secondary battery sector. With the merger, Samsung SDI will be the corporation's fifth largest business unit with a market capitalization of some 9.3 billion U.S. dollars. The company expects to see its sales expand more than threefold from $8.9 billion in 2013 to $27 billion by 2020. The merger has also shown some light on the succession of business divisions within the group. Samsung Electronics Vice Chairman Lee Jae-yong is expected to look over the electronics and finance division. His sister Lee Bu-jin will run hotels and construction, and other sister Lee Sa-hyun will control Samsung's fashion and media business. Although the Jail Industries is closing operations after 60 years, market watchers say it'll keep its name as Samsung founder Lee Byung-chul had great affection for the unit. Connie Kim, Arirang News. Now, those of our viewers in Korea might have woken up a bit earlier than expected this morning, due in part to a, a rare magnitude 5.1 Earthquake. It was the third strongest ever recorded here in Korea, but fortunately, no damage has been reported. Kwon Sawa has the details. A 5.1 magnitude earthquake shook the nation at 4.48 a.m. Tuesday morning, with an epicenter in waters around 100 kilometers west of Taean County in Chungcheongnam-do province. It's the fourth most powerful earthquake ever recorded on the Korean peninsula and the third strongest in South Korea. Tuesday's quake lasted between 5 and 7 seconds and affected an area spanning a radius of 200 kilometers, shaking buildings and other structures. Even residents of Seoul and Gyeonggi-do province were among those who felt the earth move beneath them. I was awake. My house shook so much that our refrigerator made rattling noises. 
hundreds of citizens called their local authorities to report the quake, and social network services were full of messages on the rare incident. It's also raised concerns about whether Korea is prepared for the possibility of stronger quakes. While experts say a magnitude 5 quake with an epicenter on land would likely cause damage, they add that Korea's geological site conditions make the chances of a large magnitude earthquake like those seen in Japan and China very small. Kwon Soa, Arirang News. Now for a look at the international headlines we're following at this hour, we're going to connect live to our Eunice Kim, who's standing by at the News Center. Eunice, France's socialist president has named a new prime minister following a heavy defeat at local elections on Sunday. That's right. Hi, guys. French President Francois Hollande tapped former Interior Minister Manuel Valls as his new prime minister after his former number two resigned following the ruling party's brutal election loss. The ruling Socialist Party lost more than 150 major towns in Sunday's local elections, mostly to the opposition right, the Front National. And in a televised message to the nation, President Hollande acknowledged his government's failure to turn around the Eurozone's second largest economy. He also promised to cut labor charges for business and tax cuts to boost consumer spending. Prime Minister-designate Valls is expected to present a leaner government team before President Hollande heads to Brussels later this week. And in a surprise move, Russia appears to have taken a step back. A battalion of Russian troops pulled back from the tense border between Russia and eastern Ukraine Monday. It's estimated that 40,000 men are amassed at the border area. German Chancellor Angela Merkel's office confirmed Russian President Vladimir Putin informed her in a phone call that he'd ordered a partial troop withdrawal. And earlier Monday, Russian Prime Minister Dmitry Medvedev visited Crimea with a delegation of government ministers to promise support to boost salaries, pension and local infrastructure. Kiev has condemned the visit as a crude violation of international rules. Meanwhile, NATO foreign ministers are to meet in Brussels beginning Tuesday to discuss steps that can be taken to support Ukraine. And what appeared to be a promising lead turned out to be a dead end. The four floating orange items spotted from the air, which matched the color of missing Malaysia Airlines Flight 370, was recovered Monday and were confirmed to be not plane parts, but fishing gear. Meanwhile, Malaysian authorities have revised the last words heard from the plane as good night, Malaysian 370, not all right, good night, as previously reported. The transport ministry said forensic evidence would determine who spoke those final words. Flight 370 is believed to have disappeared over the Indian Ocean while en route to Beijing from Kuala Lumpur on March 8th. The United Nations' highest court has ruled that Japan must halt its whaling program in the Southern Ocean around Antarctica after finding that it did not constitute scientific research, as Tokyo had claimed. The legally binding decision came in a 12-4 to judgment. The presiding judge said the so-called research program was responsible for killing 3,600 minke whales and a number of fin whales since 2005 with limited scientific output. The the court issued an immediate cancellation of all whaling permits under the program, a decision Japan said it would accept with disappointment. The case was brought to the International Court of Justice in 2010 by Australia, who said the program was commercial whaling in disguise. Well, the month of April started off mild and sunny, but the sunshine will give way to clouds as the day goes on. And the warm temperatures will continue today, and highs across the entire nation will rise a couple of degrees higher than yesterday. And as the weather gets milder, the risk of drowsy driving increases. And it's been reported that related accidents occur most often between 2 and 4 in the afternoon, so please be careful. 
fall out on the roads. Now, tomorrow we are expecting a similar weather pattern as today's, but eventually things will cool down a bit before the end of the week. And there is a chance of rain on Thursday in the central region. With that in mind, uh, let's take a closer look at the readings for today. The morning low in Seoul started out at 10, but the afternoon high will soar to 22. Daegu and Gwangju get up to 23, and Busan should top out at 19. Now, for other regions, it looks like down on Jeju and Daejeon will pick at 19 and 22. Tokdo climbs to 14, and mild afternoon is in store for Mount Kungang at 15. Well, that's all for me today, and hope you have a wonderful rest of the day. Okay, thank you very much for the weather there, Jian, and those are the stories we are following at this hour. Mark and I will be back at the same time tomorrow. Thank you for watching.